when your last child gets married and you, you they give you a broom and you sweep the kids <laughs> out of your life. Sweeping the children out of the house. So my first thought is, let's get a nuclear-powered vacuum cleaner. <laughs> but then I realized the vacuum cleaner sucks it back in. So we, we did brooms. We did. We we had brooms, and my mom, my dad. <laughs> Is very sentimental, obviously, and uh, <laughs> my, whereas my mom said, "I don't want to sweep you away." Yeah, it was really a lot of fun. It was, it was a good wedding. It was fun. How long ago was yours? I mean, you have a son now who's eight. I have a son. Incredibly. I have a son who's How eight. How did that happen? I, I have not. Well, I, I don't think we need to get into that at that level of detail, but, but um, it wasn't a medical yeah. question. <laughs> it was a social question. <laughs> Um, yeah. Oh gosh. So we got married in, in 2004. So it's been there. this is our bar mitzvah anniversary this year. Wow. Uh, yeah. I love it. Yeah. All right. So the two of you have actually collaborated before yes. and written um, two books about a golem. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and, and this say is, something. Okay. So, to respond. so this is so, so so you know the, we we had uh, a tremendous amount of fun writing the golem books. It was a wonderful experience. But first of all, you never know when you when you. We've had a remarkably uh, simpatico collaboration, um, and um, the Golem books were a blast to write. They're also they're super exhausting and and, and emotionally taxing, and uh, very hard books to write. They're long. They're, there's a lot of research involved. There's travel involved, and um, I th I think we we wanted to uh, to do something um, that was a little more immediate that we could get out to the public a little more quickly. Um, and this, uh, the the origin of this book, I remember, was a conversation we had back in uh, in, in Santa Fe um, a few years ago. Uh, my dad was talking about how no one's ever written a book about um, a coroner's investigator. That's a very um, it's a, it's a really interesting job, and not a lot of people know what they actually do. There's a lot of misconceptions. Some people think that they're the person who cuts the body up. That's that's not the case. That's the pathologist. Um, what the coroner's investigator does, and um, I need to caveat this by saying that it varies from place to place, but where we said it in Northern California, um, they're sheriff's deputies, they're law enforcement officers, and their job is to come out whenever someone dies in a manner that could be construed as suspicious. Not necessarily homicide, but anything that's not um, at home, out in a hospital, where there's a physician overseeing, um, and they take custody of the body, the physical remains of the decedent, um, their property. Um, they're the ones who determine the manner of death, which is not the same thing as the cause of death. Do people do people know what the difference between those two things are? Should I clarify? So the cause of death, the cause of death is is the physical mechanism of death. You're hit in the head hard enough, you die of blunt force trauma. Um, the manner of death, that's a legal term, and uh, where we are, there are five of them. There's natural, a natural death, a homicide, accident, suicide, or undetermined. Right? So you can have a blunt force trauma death that's an accident, or a suicide, or, or, uh, or a homicide. So um, whether, an whether there's going to be an investigation into that death by the police, it hinges on, on how the coroner rules um, as to the manner of death. Um, so they have this one side, which is a, a legal and investigative side. They're cops. They also have another uh, unusual aspect to their job, which is it's their it's their duty to go tell the next of kin that someone has died. They have to, if if someone dies in Alameda County, which is where we said it, um, they have to get in a car, drive to that person's house, walk up to their front door, knock, and deliver the worst possible. It's called the death knock. It's called the death knock. And so and so they have these sort of two, two two aspects to their personality. One is the cop aspect, and one is almost like a like a therapist. Um, not only do they have to deliver this news, um, they they're not allowed to leave until they're sure that the person is psychologically stable. So they will stay with that person until um, a clergy person or another relative ar arrives, because they don't want to deliver this horrible news and then just waltz out. That's not a very nice nice thing to do. So they're they're sort of in an unusual position. They have the, the investigative side and the, the humanistic therapeutic side, and those are things that we write about. I mean, in some ways, they're like the perfect embodiment of our interests as writers. So that was the origin of, of, of the character of, of Clay Edison. And it's interesting, you have to bow to reality. When we first, well, I really first thought about this years ago, because I was amazed that no one had ever written a book about a CI. 
And in LA, where I live, it's a whole different thing. They're mostly nurses, social workers, occasionally retired cops. They're civilians. Um, not like in the movies and TV where they always show a pathologist. Doctors don't show up unless it's Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> you know, Tom Noguchi was there, lickety split with Marilyn Monroe. Unless it's a, a celebrity or some unusual situation, you don't get a doctor. Uh, you get a CI. And, and in LA they say, you know, the police have the case, the coroner has the body. So I thought, and I met some of these people and I'd seen them, I thought what they did was interesting. It was amazing to me with all the thousands of crime novels that have been written, nobody had written a book about it. So Jess and I were talking about it, and then we decided to do up in Northern California, and we found out it's a whole different system. A whole different system. So we had a, you have to be flexible, we had a shift. And gaining access to the Alameda Sheriff proved a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, it took, it took a bunch of phone It took calls. a bunch of letters and phone calls and free books, and uh, <laughs> I've never, we've never had a problem. Faye, Faye and I did a couple of novellas years ago, we were in New Orleans, not, not, not New Orleans, we were in Santa Fe, and we were in Nashville, and we were in Berkeley, and the cops were so cooperative. Never had a problem in L.A., been to the crime lab, been to the coroners, just couldn't get in to Alameda County because there's so much ethnic, racial, and political tension between the police, the sheriffs, and the surrounding communities. And there are a lot of communities in Alameda County. You have everything from Piedmont to tough parts of Oakland. So we got in, and once Jesse was in, he made friends with everyone. <laughs> I went, so so, so I'll, I'll add one thing to that, which is that um, in addition to writing about this very interesting job that um, not a lot of people know about, I, you know, I live up in Northern California. That's where I've been for a few years where my wife grew up. Um, I really wanted to write about the uh, the Bay Area, and particularly the East Bay, where I live, Berkeley and Oakland, um, because as far as I know, again, there's there's not a lot of fiction, crime fiction, written in that, and it's a really interesting place. That's in Dashiell Hammett. Yeah, right. And you have you have San Francisco to to a, to a certain extent, but it's a really it's 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 its own community, and. Um, and as my dad alluded to, it's what you call a very unique policing environment. And, there, and there's tremendous, tremendous local differences between the way the police operate there in Oakland and Berkeley and all these places. So we wanted to, to be able to explore some of that. The sheriffs, I think, for those reasons, they're like a little suspicious. Um, but once you go in there um, and you sit in the office, with, I, I just went and sat in the office for days and eventually I forgot I was there and started acting normal again. Um, they, they, I think once it be, they had to sort of understand that I was not there to um, try to uh, do an expose of a trash. I had to write an actual letter to the sheriff, who is the coroner. Yeah, officially he's the coroner. The sheriff's the coroner. It's, you know, coroner doesn't have to be an MD. You have a, you have a pathologist, but in many ta even San Bernardino, uh, San Bernardino, California, the sheriff is the coroner. So I had to write him a letter. Say, look, I've written. Lots of books. My son's written lots of books. We don't write exposés, and it, it was really tough getting. It's the only time I've ever. And I, I think also it was also important to, and I think that they appreciate this. We're not there to whitewash anything. We're there to describe what's going on. And I think, uh, you know, there's if you if you follow the news, I don't know why any you would follow the, our local news, but uh, there's been a lot of or any news. <laughs> Well, they're obviously gloves for punishment because they're here. So, <laughs> I, I, um, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of turmoil in in, in, in the Bay Area in, in terms of law enforcement in the last few years. And so, I, I sort of didn't know what I was walking into when I walked into that room. The people that I met, it's a very small department. This is a, an area that covers like 800 square miles and millions of people, and there's only four of them at any given time. They all, they work in shifts of four, and they go out in pairs on call. So like, which is bananas when you think of that. So like, when something really big happens, it's an all hand situation. This is a small group of people who are very specifically oriented toward this kind of work. As a matter of fact, that notion of a big thing happening is in the sequel to this. Yeah, book. that's the true. All right, let me ask a question because this actually came up in real life with a crime writer not here to be named tonight. But um, <laughs> you can go and talk to them about their techniques and you can follow them, but you can't actually write about at least an open case. 
Right. Which we, I don't think we would do anyway because we, 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 we prefer to have the, um, first of all... I, you have to make up the crime. Like say, right. it, first of all, that's, half, that's the fun, you know, right. is getting to make it up. We certainly, you know, we read widely and we synthesize from reality, but it's, it's pure fiction. Um, the experiences that I had when I was on duty were very powerful to me. I, I walked into a motel room, you know, I got there on the first day within 30 minutes, I was in a motel room looking down at a dead woman who had died of a drug overdose. Um, and that was an extremely powerful experience, but I didn't transplant that experience directly, but you transplant is the emotional experience of that. Well, this, this has always come up in my life as a writer because, as most of you probably know, I used to be a psychologist. And people would say, do you ever write about patients? So I, of course, didn't ethically. I had no desire to anyway. And so I bent over backwards never to talk about real people. Uh, it made me a better writer, but the truth is, people like us really like making stuff up. I'm, I'm getting paid very well to do what I got in trouble in school, <laughs> which is spacing out and making up stories, and my wife was one of those freaks too, so not surprisingly, a couple of our kids are like that too. We really, people don't appreciate, so I can't tell you how many times over the years, people have come up to me and said, I know who Milo Sturgis is based on. I said, I made him up. He's totally made up. But people will spot something. It's like a Rorschach test, and they project themselves onto it. So we really, we have the story before we go in, really, and do the research. It's going to be amended based on reality. Right. We, I mean, we want to stay, I think, within the bounds of what could, could happen. Um, you know, certainly, yeah. you know, with 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 the Golem series, we, we got to push those boundaries yeah. a little bit. But this, you know, these books are, they're they're more uh, classically structured um, and, and procedurals. So, you know, of course, what's interesting are always the cases that push the boundaries and that are that are different. And so those are the ones we look for. And these and this book and the series, this is definitely going to be a series. We just just signed a contract for a whole lot more of these. So I promise you. A lot more Delawares and a lot more Clay, Clay Edisons. This is definitely something we're going to be doing for several years. This is to some extent spiritual cousin of the Delaware series in the sense that there's a lot of psychological complexity to this character and to the cases that he's, he's a very interesting fellow. Yeah. And Jesse being such a brilliant, wonderful writer, it's a pleasure. No, I mean it. It's a pleasure for me to work with him on it because he understands that. I can work with somebody who, who kind of gets it. Right. I'd like to second that. Jesse has been here for his standalone book. You've been here for everything you've ever written, right? Every book. And Jesse My home wrote, from home. wrote some novels that I thought were wonderful uh, when he wrote them himself. But I also think that one of the most interesting things about this collaboration. I'm used to Jonathan's voice, I'm used to Jesse's voice, and probably you are too. This is yet a third voice. Yeah. And the New York Times writing a very favorable review of Crime Scene, um, probably a month ago, yeah. your publication date. I wish I wrote it in the news that some of you get, but I can't remember it right offhand, but it ended by... She was speculating about, I think, who wrote, who wrote what. Exactly, but she said at the end, whoever wrote, and then she quoted a line. That was, that was his line. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, uh, <laughs> right, she got a pat on the back. No, when, even with the first Golem book, uh, Stephen King, who's just the most gracious uh, writer to other writers, always has been, so I sent him the first Golem book, the Golem of Hollywood, and he wrote, first of all, he gave a wonderful quote and blurb, saying the book took his breath away. But he also said, he sent me a personal email, and he said, John, I know your voice, and I know Jesse's voice, and this is really a synthesis of your two voices, and that's exactly what we're aiming for. You know, it's going to be different from my books, it's going to be different from Jess, but hopefully has some of the same appeal that both of us have. And I don't want to be too soppy and sentimental, you know, I love my son, I love all of my children, but you never know what writing with someone is going to be like. The only people I've ever written with are Faye and Jess. And in both cases, uh, it worked out extremely well. But you don't know until you do it. Uh, however, technique I learned writing with Faye helped me here. When Faye and I did the novellas, Capital Crimes, and, and Double Homicide, we obviously live in the same house. It's a fairly sizable house, so I'm on one wing, she's in another wing. 
We never had a face-to-face -face meeting on those books. It was, we never sat down once we started writing. We, we did talk about before, and we did research trips, and we went to these various cities. But once we started writing, it was all done with email. And so with Jesse, it became necessary. He lives in a different city. So yes, we had lots of phone phone calls. We I'll, I'd fly up to Berkeley. He'd fly down to. We'd have story meetings and conferences. Yeah, I, I, I like I like our face to. I feel yeah, the face to face is fun. I, I, I find that we can get more done in forty five minutes yeah. face to face than than a, a, a month of email. The only distraction is when I come up to his house. I want to play with yeah, his kids. kids yeah. <laughs> he has this little eighteen month old. I call her my Swedish grand granddaughter. She's a redhead. She's so cute, and she gives me big hugs when I see her. Right? She does. She does. She, loves, she, loves she latches on like a limpet. So, but once the kids are taken care of, they can sit and have a meal. So, when I was searching for a way to describe this book for those who haven't read it, I said Alex Delaware meets Temperance Brennan. You know, the psychiatrist and the forensic thing which I thought kind of embraced the two sides that you're talking about. So, um, although we've now discussed what the coroner yeah. investigator job is, who gets, I mean, to kick this book off, who is the body that he goes to view? So, so we, um, I, I, and I think that this was, uh, this was like sort of a conscious nod to, to our roots. It, he's a dead psychologist. Found <laughs> <laughs> at the bottom of the stairs. See, and, 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 you know, and I, and I think that um, that gave us like a really, a really obvious entree to talk about things, things that we love and are, are familiar with. You know, the, the, the beauty of, uh, the beauty of writing about the human mind and psychology is that it's, it's limitless, and I think that. Um, in this particular case, we were interested in writing about um, something that looks innocuous but might not be innocuous. Um, that, that was, if I had to, you know, say what's the origin of the story, that was, it was that one, it was that one concept. Yeah, and also, we have a, not a gratuitous, a meaningful cameo with Dr. Delaware. <laughs> Very much in context with the story. I will, I will say that, that uh, Marilyn Stasio's review, she said, well, it's obvious that Jonathan wrote that scene with Delaware. I, I wrote that scene, actually. I gave away trade secrets. Well, well I wrote, what I did is I wrote it, and then I sent it to him as well. Delaware wouldn't say that. So we, we sort of ironed it up. The way we do with all the writing is, you know, he writes something, I, I take a crack at it. I write something, he takes cr a crack at it. Um, but it, it's it's actually really fun, and this is true of any time you're writing fiction. Is you get to channel somebody else. I get to have you know my dad sitting on my shoulder, you know, imagine you know what would Alex Delaware say. Nevertheless, he should always have the power of review if it's actually Alex's voice. It's his character. It's, it's his character. But but I think the fact that, that that I was able to to write it and and for the most part, you would like the scene. So that was that was that was good. That it was, was that great. Was well, you so. both brought, you know, you both brought your whole experience um, to the book. You know, obviously the psychology parts. Um, Jesse grew up with you, so you know they're not foreign to him. But um, although I, we didn't live in a psychologist household, I don't think, did we? <laughs> Maybe we no. did. No, it wasn't. It wasn't very careful not to be a shriek. With no, it wasn't. Oh, okay. It wasn't one of those households where you know. Uh, there's analysis happening over dinner. I, it's not. It's not it, it, I, I think. I think if if there if, if it informed anything, it was if any any of your psych psych background informed anything about our upbringing. It was, you know, I was born in 1978, which is you know there was a sort of tail end of the free to be you and me <laughs> in, in, in psychology. So we I had a lot of latitude as as I it. Probably would have done that anyway. You know, it's funny. But I have four four kids. Jesse's the oldest. Aliza, who's a Polish novelist, when I got married, is the youngest. In between are Rachel and Ilana, and they both have PhDs in psychology. <laughs> and they're very different from each other. One's an adult psychologist, one's a child and, and And different from you. Even Ilana, who's a child yeah. psychologist, her, her, her interests are different. Yeah. You know? But I just think it's funny. Like, I don't know. I, we never ever said, do this or do that. It's kind of interesting. Last summer, it was the summer before, I was in Toronto, and I gave the keynote address at the American Psychological Association. And I really hadn't been involved professionally for many years. And it was interesting to me how many multi-generational psychologists or how many grandparents and grandchildren and parents. And also, I'm going to say this, whether you believe it or not, resolutely normal bunch of people. I mean, <laughs> this is one of my peeves, and that is that 
psychologists and psychiatrists are portrayed in, in fiction in one of two ways. Generally, either the evil Spengali or the totally screwed up person. And I think something, I hate Cracker. I think that's like the worst show ever done. It makes no sense. It, it just doesn't ring, ring true, you know. It, it's, all, it's such an easy trope. Screwed up, but as a therapist. I'm not saying that never happens, but in general, these are pretty serious people who are doing a tough job. It's really interesting that if two of them are psychologists, the other two are writers. Yeah, I mean, there must it's, be something in the water at your house. You know, Faye had a brief uh, fling as a dentist, but nobody became a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the good news is that this is the first of a series. Yeah. You, um, it, you started the second book. Can yes. you? About halfway done. We're, we're yeah, yeah, we're pretty we're pretty far into it. It's it's going great. Great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. We all, well, I think we always feel that way when, when we're in the middle of it. But I, 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 what I, I think it's a sign that you've you've hit uh, you've, you've hit a uh, vein when the second one comes quickly and easily, and the story al almost writes itself. And and also that you start uncovering more layers to your protagonist. Yeah. That that's that's the main thing is that we really see, obviously that this you know the story is paramount, but we see him as a as a rich as a rich source of, of, of fiction. He's an intelligent, I hate to use the word sensitive, but <laughs> as a, a more, he has a, a moral, he has spine. He's a moral person. I, I've always liked to write, I, I'm not a big fan of anti-hero. Uh, when I started to write fiction in the 80s, the anti-hero was the norm. So I thought I was being a big rebel by having a nice guy or a good person. I just, it's more appealing to me. Well, yeah, I've been on the beach with you two in Hawaii while this book was evolving. I have been with you and Faye and doing things in Santa Fe this summer, Jonathan, and the whole time you you have talked about how excited you are about about doing this, not just with Jesse, but about this character and exploring it. This is the first time I, I remember hearing you say that you thought about this for a long time. I thought for some reason this was a relatively new. Well, I... I'm old and I have no short-term memory. <laughs> so for the last 20 years, I just I just turned 68 and I have no short-term memory, and I I write things down, and all of a sudden I have over 80 storylines for for novels. I write things down that intrigue me. Often I don't even use them. I think of something new, but this this had stuck in my head when I I had been to the to the LA corner. And I had met some of these people, I saw what they did. And it was, it's always, how come no one's ever done a book? And they're fascinating people, and they're nice people. But the evolution as to this book, this that's contemporary. That's something yeah. that evolved from here and now. Yeah, it started it started from, from a point and it yeah. became the idea people say, Oh, I have an idea. Great. <laughs> write write a book. <laughs> Getting an idea to a novel is a big is a big big production. It's quite a quite a a task. Well, wow, you certainly are polished at it. But well, you're finally it's, learning how to do it. After right. it's, it's, new. it's every time it's new. It's a. It's. it's I mean, it's, it, it, it's not. Especially if you're trying not to repeat yourself again and again. It's. It's. A, you know, I mean, that's. It's. That's what makes it fun. Like. It, like a challenge is. I, I think a challenge is a fun thing. So it's. It's something that I look forward to getting up with and struggling every day. In the sense that it's struggling. In the sense that. Um, you know, it's it's important and you care about it. Not in the sense that I'm like, I'm lost for words or ter tearing my hair out. Um, it's a pleasurable struggle. It's it's a wonderful job. I love my job. I think it's the best job in the world. And because of people like you, I get to keep doing it. So I'm really grateful <laughs> because I've done other jobs. I know the difference between real work and this. You know, but it is hard. <laughs> Honest labor, no. But it is hard. And the interesting thing is, three hours of writing feels like eight hours of something else. I mean, I've been working since the age of twelve. I did everything to <coughs> sell newspapers and pick carrots all the way up to being a psychologist and being a novelist. It's, the energy expended, and, I, and other writers tell me the same thing. It's so much concentration, especially writing fiction, where you're creating worlds. And it, it's such a thrill to me to have a son who, who knows how to do it. You know, because it's, you never know. 
You know, that's a really interesting point because we, we now do a certain amount of science fiction. We've had some amazing science fiction writers here and always um, it's about world building, especially if it's like the first book and, you know, there's a whole... Uh, and I don't think about that so often with crime fiction, but in point of fact, that's really what you have done here, isn't it? You've built the world of the coroner's investigation for us to enter with you. It's, it's really the closest thing you can do and still be a moral person and play God. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like a politician or something. Yeah. <laughs> Well, wow, that seems like a wonderful moment in which we could say thank you to our Facebook audience for watching this. And we'd like to open up to questions um, from you guys. Um, I know some of the Facebook people may say, now that it's off, uh, that that's not fair. But I think since you've all come here tonight that you get priority over, over those people not actually here. So... Um, Ask away. Jesse, you want to do the MC? I will do it, yes. I, yes. I haven't read the book yet, but you were talking about Alameda County, and it made me think, in the book, you really go into great depth on, say, the Berkeley, Oakland, Piedmont sort of contradictions? Oh, oh yes. Yeah. I mean, because that's, that's where I live. That's very real to me. Um, and uh, it's, it's something, it's, it's, it's a place where um, those kinds of divisions and um, re really seem to matter. Um, it's a small place with a lot going on and a lot of strong personalities and a lot of uh, passion. And I think that that's um, tr tremendously rich fodder for I mean, my dad has written in Los Angeles and one of, one of the drivers uh, he's, he's talked about before is, uh, for, for his fiction, is, is the contrast between the haves and the have-nots have is a constant theme in, in the Delaware book. And you see that too in a different way where I live, it manifests in a different way. I'm not going to give away any story, but one of the most interesting scenes created by Jesse involves a tree. <laughs> yeah. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so, you're talking about writing being hard work. I teach nine year olds to write. So, no. yeah. so uh, with that in mind, um, you know, we get. The, you know, they get, the, they get the process, but getting the details to the process is hard. And so we take breaks. What do you do when you take your break so that you can figure out how to get it? I don't take a break when I'm writing. I'll just go straight through and I write until I'm exhausted. And that's when I quit. Could be two hours, could be five hours. I just keep, and I start making typos. You know, my fine motor coordination falls apart, so I don't take a break. And then I have all these great notions about what I'm going to do. For example, I love to paint. And that's actually what I do best. That's what I could do as a child, as a child prodigy, as an artist. So I have this notion that I'm going to write, and I'm going to go to the studio and paint, and I can't do it. And I asked um, this guy I know who's a noble quality neuroscientist, Antonio Damasio, I said, Antonio, why, why do you think? He says, he thought about it, he said, well, you're, t you're probably painting with words and exhausting the visual neurons in your brain. So generally I take a break, go to the gym, get some exercise, I can play music, so I play a little music, have a meal, you know, <laughs> mope around the house, you know, read my email, and sometimes I go back to writing. I mean, there, are, there have been years I've done two or three books in one year. That starts to feel like a real job. You're working all day. But I, I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. I, um, I, I, I try to break it up every 30 to 60 minutes with some sort of physical activity, both you know, to preserve my, my back. Um, and also, I just find it, it helps. I'll get out and I'll just walk, I'll walk around the block. I'll, I, I take a, 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 like a two-hour break in the middle of the day to exercise. and deal with deal with stuff. Um, um, I meditate. Um, I take a bath. I don't sometimes I wouldn't recommend that for your class. <laughs> not, not practical. But, but I think physical activity is really, really, really helpful. Um, as he as he uh, alluded to, music is I also find music very helpful because it really does work a different part of the brain. So I can play music whereas um, Anything that it, that is nonverbal, I find is a helpful reset for me. I, I find music really helpful. But I'm spending almost as much time playing music as well. I like it because it releases my stress. Right. <laughs> yeah. Nine well, you know, it's funny, you're a fourth grade teacher, right? And it's interesting because 
the only real, I, I've never really had a mentor, but I had a fourth grade teacher uh, in New York in my last year before we moved to California who was extremely encouraging of my writing. And I think really made a big difference. And it was a, it was a class where they tracked you based on your abilities. It was a gifted class. And I was, I was like the dummy in this class. A lot smarter people. One of my friends skipped out of this class. But it was great because uh, she taught us poetry, didn't need to rhyme, and we had a lot of creativity. And, and, and I think it made, I think it was part of what made me a writer. Um, in regards to building your world and whatnot, how have you felt that how rapidly technology advances plays a part in you keeping up with the world that you're creating? Well, I'm kind of a Luddite, so, you know, <laughs> he's much more in touch with this stuff. In fact, the book we're working on uh, now, he's got all this social network stuff. I'm old enough that I read my, you know, my, occasionally I have to go back to an old novel just for accuracy, and there's pay phones. <laughs> I, I mean, you realize I'm old enough to be anachronistic at this point, so you have to adapt to, to reality. I, I try to stay, I'm not interested in it very much, so I try to emphasize the human aspect in my books, but you can't, you can't ignore it totally. I, I try to avoid, if you see a, a good cop, cop show on TV, like a British cop show, there's always with the CCTV cameras and the cell phones, and you have to deal with it, especially in Britain where there's cameras everywhere. But I try, I try to get past that and concentrate on the human aspect. I would I would say that um, insofar as some of some of uh, some of the technologies that we've seen develop over the last ten years, um, they allow for expressions of the same human emotions that we've been feeling for thousands and thousands yeah. of years. In in I'm not going to say novel, but maybe larger scale ways. Um, that, that's 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 interesting and useful because because now um, you can you can. Um, you can talk about the way um, you know uh, a crime, with the way a, a video of a crime can go viral, can go viral, and the emotional aspects that that, that 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 brings along with it, the effect on the victim. So you know, we're always, like he said, we're always looking for the for the humanity behind the story. Um, we're not. Neither of us are b big into reading or writing books where it's about gadgets. That's that's sort of. I mean, there are, there are people who do that brilliantly, but that's sort of not our stock in trade. Ultimately, it's 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 the people that are more interesting to us. You know, it's 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 interesting. DNA has obviously been tremendous advance, uh, mostly with cold cases, but occasionally, you know, but still, very few cases are solved by forensics. Very most of it is still solved by good old fashion shoe leather police work, and to sometimes luck. If I may get back to what you were referring to just shortly ago, what is the story of With Strings Attached? With Strings Attached is a nonfiction art yeah. book based on my guitar collection. Okay. So I thought, good title for a book on guitars. That was uh, published in 2007. It was an art book. And that's probably the closest I'm ever going to come to writing an autobiography. I have this large collection of musical instruments, but I tell a lot of stories through through those instruments, and the photography is really stunning. So it was a very nice book. Do you make the guitars also? No, I just play them. <laughs> I, have, I have no mechanical. Mom, made, mom made one. One of the guitars is a is a guitar fashioned by fate in 1981. Yeah, yeah. she built it, and it is a beautiful it's a instrument. Really good instrument. It's the guitar that I learned to play on. Yeah, and people come. You know, I have a lot of. I have a nice collection of very important instruments. People play them. Then I give them Faye's guitar, and then I tell them who made it. These are guitar makers and musicians. And, it, it was interesting, you know, Faye has a DDS, but she never practiced industry. She graduated six months pregnant with this gentleman. And, and then she said, I'll go back when he's, he's so cute, you know, and I'll be a good mom. And then she got pregnant again, and finally she, she got published. So I used to bring my guitars to a guy named Lloyd, Lloyd Baggs, who had a shop downtown near the hospital where I worked. And uh, Faye visited me once, and she saw what he did. He made guitar, he was a guitar builder. She said, oh, a lot of inlay. It's like dentistry without the blood. <laughs> so it was 81. She was pregnant with our second child with Rachel. And she apprenticed with Lloyd for a summer and built this one instrument. And she's a mandolinist. She was planning to build a mandolin. She bought the wood. She never did it. 
But this is really good guitar. Really good guitar. That's fascinating. Have any of you been out to the Musical Instrument Museum here? It's fantastic. Yeah. Do you remember, they, wasn't it last year, they had that incredible guitar? Inlaid. Oh. Yes, and they were inlaid. It was like mosaic work and the yeah. guitars Well, you can go crazy on that. No kidding. I mean, it was really a revelation. Sometimes those don't sound good because there's too much stuff in the right. soundboard. Right, but they look beautiful. They, look they, <laughs> they didn't play them. They were there right. as, as works of art. Yeah, they were really stunning. Absolutely. <laughs> So I was curious about how you built your characters. I've read both of your individual novels and then the uh, Golem series as well. And um, your characters for both of you are so three-dimensional, uh, which is one of the things that makes them so enjoyable because they feel like real people, not characters. Um, and I know that you've said that they're completely made up. Do you find yourselves injecting facets of you into some of your characters? <laughs> <laughs> Probably all fiction is autobiography to some extent, but Faye, Faye, ta Faye writes a series with a six foot three redheaded cop, and she's five two on a good day. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I just, these people come to you as apparitions. Sometimes when you're dreaming, it's just spacing out. And what I said before about the stuff I used to get in trouble in school for, like I'd be spacing out, making a story, and then all of a sudden, the teacher will call on me, and I've been, I've been out of it for 20 minutes. Uh, Jesse was a little more on point, I think. He managed to be a, a really good student and focus and still have a good imagination. But with me, uh, I mean, I was a decent student, but it was always wrestling back and forth. So this stuff just, it just comes, and I just think about it, and I don't know. I, it's a kind of still a mysterious process to me. I wish I had a, you know, a simple answer. Uh, Books can come in all kinds of ways. I'm not really a premise-driven novelist like Tom Clancy. Or, uh, but one of the reasons I think that my books have not been adapted for films, you can't sum them up in one sentence, you know, X-Man meets Julia Roberts. It, it, my books don't lend themselves to that because they're, they're complex. And I just, generally I just spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff. I do have these ideas that I've written, these 80 plus ideas. So once I have a story that I want to tell, then I think about the people. I mean, I'm planning a new book right now. I just finished outlining another novel, next Delaware novel, which is called The Wedding Guest. And um, I think there's one coming up before it called Night Night Moves. I mean, in February, but this will be the book comes out the following year. So you just kind of think about it, and they. I mean, what? What happens to you? I, 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 would I have say, no idea about his internal process. I would say that that, that question takes us as an assumption that, that I that I know me, which which I I don't know that I do. <laughs> um, I mean, and, and and I would say that to a certain extent, creating a character is it, it's it is one of the things that's it's revelatory. It's 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 an act of self discovery and self exploration. Like you find yourself coming out with phrases or things that you you. They're clearly in there somewhere, but you don't necessarily know that they're there. So that's so so that's that's an interesting um, that's an interesting part of the process of what you learn about yourself. You know, I would say that in terms of in terms of how to, how to build a character, it's it's not a it's not a linear, right? You, the the book starts as as he said, the book can start from a lot of different points. You can start from the point of character, it can start from the point of, 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 of story, it can start from the point of setting, or some combination of all those. And then as you write it, the demands it, it's you know, it's it's a tapestry, you pull a thread here and something over there moves and, and you adjust your character to, to, to fit. I, I tend to because I because I'm I'm most interested in people, I tend to start, even if I'm starting with um, a story idea and a plot point that, that that's sort of the, the origin of the book to me. I always start by writing an extensive biography of the character, um, going back often in a relevantly long um, time, gen generation. Sometimes I want to know where their families came from. Where the, this is this is the, we're different in, in, in this way. It's been interesting to see how we are, we're very different. Um, like he's more spontaneous, I think. Um, and I'm, I'm a very tightly controlled person when it comes to this kind of thing. So, so, um, but, but that's, but that's, that's, that's a starting point. And, and as you go along, you realize, oh, that, that actually doesn't make sense for who this person is. Like, you know, Clay is a, is a former basketball player. That's a big part. He's a former star athlete. That's a big part of his personality. Um, so, um, and I, and I knew I wanted to, you know, I wanted to incorporate that aspect into his character, but 
you don't um, have all the answers when you start. Well, well, what kind of person, you know, becomes becomes a star athlete? You know, what kind of personality gets gets you there? Who are the family members who are going to inform him, drive him, thwart him? You know, um, how is he going to react to that? You know, and, and 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 so those those questions are often unanswerable until you're writing a scene and they arise. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, and what Jesse said, I, I thought I was a perfectionist until I started working with Jesse. <laughs> like, he has a timeline. I do my timeline after I finish the book. <laughs> I do a timeline and then I make sure when I'm rewriting and editing, everything makes sense. It's just a different way of doing things, but it's fun to collaborate with somebody. My basic thing, like, if I play music, I want to play with somebody with good chops. I don't know if you know that. Expression. I mean, someone who's technically knows what they're doing. And when I write with someone, I want to write with somebody with good chops. Otherwise, it's just going to be a constant hassle, basically. I have a corollary question. Yeah. Um, you've written so many books about Alex and yeah. Milo. Do you discover new aspects of them in each book that you write? Yes. I mean, they evolve. They're people. That was a conscious decision. <laughs> Faye, Faye and I both broke, and along with people like Sue Grafton in the mid-'80s which was considered the, the second golden age of crime writing. We're just lucky to break in when a lot of talented people broke in. Um, that, the first golden age being like you know, Raymond Chandler and Ross MacDonald, that kind of thing. Great, great writers. But to some extent, Agatha Christie was the standard. Now, I think Agatha Christie was a genius. This is not a, a put down. But I think it's true that most of her characters were fairly static people. They don't change a lot. They were basically vehicles for solving a puzzle. And it was a great puzzle. She wove a great puzzle. The great stories. Interestingly, the new the adaptations are a little more character driven. But I made a, a, a conscious decision. This is going to be an evolving character because it's a novel like anything else. I don't want to be pretentious, but I, I, I consider these crime novels. They're novels in which the impetus for turning the page is based on a crime. Every every novel is a mystery, or you're not going to read it. You want to know what's going to happen next. In the case of a crime novel, it's a literal crime. But almost anything interesting that changes people. When I was a psychologist at Children's Hospital, I saw what a diagnosis of a bad disease in a child could do to a family in terms of catalyzing. So anything can really get the action going. I like to write about crime. But yes, Alex, I'm still discovering new things. Basically. My theory is that you stop writing by them. You would stop writing about him if he right. became boring or static. Right, right. They're interesting to me. I, they're, you know, some people who write long, I mean, I think Sue and I have the longest running crime series in America, I think. She started in 84, I started in 85. I don't think there's any, maybe I'm missing one. But a lot of people get tired of their hero. Conan Doyle killed off Sherlock, had to bring him back. Raymond Chandler had lots of problems with Marlon. I love those guys. Great. Okay. Yeah. More Good. <laughs> do you guys each um, do you have a favorite book that you've written or of each other's? That well, I have a favorite book of. I mean, I I'm I love Jesse. I love Jesse and I love his books. But his book, The Genius, is a work of genius. Mm -hmm. It was a huge international bestseller. I think it's just an amazing piece of work. It's the one I wish I would have written. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, it's always a book I'm working on now. Yeah. I think I think my favorite book of yours is Billy Straight. Really? I love that book. I, I mean, I love the I love I love the Delaware books, but Billy Straight is also just a, a really a really it's a it's a moving book, and I and I think that um, uh, it's it to, to me. It, you talked about your books, you know, being difficult to adapt. To me, that would be a great film. I don't know why that hasn't been turned into a it's, great mystery. It's a, <laughs> but that's a that's a that's a that's a fabulous. Book. Thank you. We came up with a list a long time ago of trying to figure out who would play Alex and Milo. <laughs> <laughs> Ted Danson and Richard now. Richard Messer. Well, like, they did it in 1986, yeah. and they yeah. did a fine job. I have, have a deal. I have, I, up the first I have a development deal now. We're trying to find a good showrunner, a good head writer. It's proving a little bit of a challenge, but I'm, I'm optimistic still. And we're not going to do it for network. You know, if we do, we'll do it for streaming because I think that's, that's where the, the best. Good, that's where the good stuff is really done. Here's one over here. Okay, you talked about spontaneous versus tightly controlled. So, do you guys like? put together an outline and then kind of decide, okay, 
who writes like the first paragraph? Who do you decide who like starts what and what parts interest each of you? Well, I don't want to give away too many trade trade secrets, <laughs> but yeah, we do. I mean, with with the Golem, the first Golem book started because I had started that book for about eighty pages of it. And then I just like, I don't know, you know, I was working on two other novels, The Delaware and a Non-Delaware. I was working on The Murderer's Daughter and a, and a Delaware. And so, Jesse and I thought we'd give it a stamp. It was a spontaneous thing. He was visiting with his wife and kids uh, down in L.A. We were chatting about it. He looked at it, he said, what's that? I said, it's something I started, but I'm not sure of him. We did that. Subsequently, oh yes, outlining, I mean, the outlines are way longer than I would do for my own books. We have a 120 page outline on the Golem of Paris. It's a mini book. Uh, my outlines are way shorter. Uh, and then we, we trade drafts back and forth. We just trade them back and forth. I mean, we, bo we both outline. There's, I, I think that it's, um, that was uh, the single most important step forward I took as a writer was when I, when I started taking like, the outlining process ser seriously. But, uh, you know, I, I would say as I've as I've uh, continued to write my lines, I've gotten longer and longer and more elaborate. Um, yours, I think for, for the devil, what are they, like 20, 30 pages? So, you know, whereas I like to write almost a mini, a mini book. Um, it, 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 it's not a clean ratio, but it's, for me, it's something like four pages of book to one page of outline. It's, it gets pretty long. <laughs> he, he, I should have encouraged him to go to med school and become a neurosurgeon. <laughs> I could take him out to lunch when he was three and he wouldn't get a spot on his shirt. And he's just really a meticulous guy. <laughs> he talks about exercising. He doesn't tell you what kind of exercise he does. Is this, is this necessary? <laughs> Heavy yes. weightlifting. Mm -hmm. Scary heavy weightlifting. Oh, wow. Well, we certainly have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Fair lady over there. Mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to piggyback on the character question. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you create these characters, do you have the intent of your readers having a certain opinion or emotion about the characters? For example, in Crime Scene, there's a character we meet right away, and um, I'm kind of ambivalent about her, and by the end of the book, I can't stand her. <laughs> and, and I just did, was that intentional, or is it just me because of the circumstances of the story? I don't. I don't think you can ever. I mean, I. I, mean, I, 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 I know who you're talking about. I mean, I mean, she's an she's an ambivalent character, a complex character. Um, I, I don't. I don't think. Either of us sit down and say we're going to write this person this way to produce this result in in, in a reader. I mean, to me, the fact that you you react to her at all is is that's that's the point, right? That's you know, success. That's success. You know, I think for for this for the for the sake of writing a series and and, and having a protagonist who you want to return to again and again, we want somebody who is going to be appealing. I think that you can do that in a lot of different ways. There, I mean, we don't generally write antiheroes, but but you can write an antihero. Who's, who's a good, well, yeah, exactly. Jacob's a good example. Um, in terms of the ancillary character, I mean, we try to populate the world with real people, and there, there are obnoxious people in this world. <laughs> I, I'm acutely aware that when I'm writing professionally, I'm writing for an audience, and I'm communicating. I made a big mistake when I first started. I used to go to England and do book tours. And British journalists are really cheeky. And he asked me, and I made some offhand comment, well, it's communication, not masturbation. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. That was the headline. So you know, I learned my lesson. But it's true. You're not writing for yourself. You're writing for other people. That said, the actual process, I'm in an altered state. I used to do clinical hypnosis. And I think that writing is a, an hypnoidal and hypnotic -like state. Because the same things that happen with hypnosis, contraction of time, you know, you sit down three hours, half past, occur at least for me when I'm writing. And a lot of writers tell me the same thing. I'm in an altered state. And I find myself, I will actually find myself posturally tensing up when I'm in a tense scene and actually talking out loud to myself. It, it, it's. So I'm not really consciously trying to make you feel a certain way. I'm trying to make myself feel a certain way, and hopefully you'll feel the same way. I think I should add, too, and it's really important. I say this all the time. Every reader reads a book differently. Your experience is not going to be her experience or whatever. And a writer 
can't write for each individual. You know, you write, and then each of you brings who you are and your life and experience and emotions to the book. I think what that's there are always three stages to a book, and Jonathan's already touched on that. The first one is the one, it's why the book he's writing on is his favorite. It can still be perfect. It's still in his head. It hasn't yet come out. It can be everything he wants it to be. Then there's the actual book that gets published, you know, which is the best attempt there is to reach that sort of platonic thing. And then there's the book that all of you read, each one of you. And so if you think about it that way, you know, um, everybody's taste is different. It's like wine. And I will end this by saying, which won't apply to the book tonight, it's really important. Don't waste your time reading a book that doesn't work for you. Read 50 pages. You know, it's like you don't have to clean your plate. You really don't have to, you don't have to finish a bad book. And, you know, the fact that you don't like it and three other people you know think it's fabulous doesn't matter. It really doesn't. So I would like to, th oh, I'm sorry, if you no, want no, to no. add a code, no, go ahead. I, I think that's totally right. And I, I would just say that I think, especially in this day and age where everybody's opinion is visible, <laughs> there's like a, 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 something that bothers me, and I, 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 I'm not going to take this on the shoulders of my generation, but like there's a I think there's a confusion between what you enjoy aesthetically and who, whether you're a good person. <laughs> like people seem to take like it, uh, matters of taste as matters of morality, and I think that's a, ter a terrible mistake. A terrible, terrible, terrible mistake. And so, like people like our books, that that's wonderful. That doesn't make you a great person. <laughs> but, but also, if you, if you don't like, if you don't like the book, that doesn't make you a bad person either. You know. Can I just say briefly? I sometimes I'm surprised by how people react. The murderer's daughter. I had some people tell me they didn't like Grace. I thought she was that heroic person who overcame adversity, and but some people didn't like her. Yeah. So it's just. It's a Rorschach test. It's a projective test. You put yourself onto it, which is part of the fun. Yeah, it is. Also, I think sometimes it's the timing of when some books would work, you know, in a certain period, and some years later might not. You know, I've often been asked to explain the Da Vinci Code, why it became, it. and I, I say to people, think about it. John Grisham wrote The Firm, the year the law firms were allowed to advertise, and so the idea that there could be really wicked law firms had resonance. The Da Vinci Code was written when all of the allegations about priests were beginning to surface and the Pope was dying and people wanted or were willing to believe that there was perhaps some kind of you know, bad things going on in the Catholic Church. Could you could you do that today with this Pope? Maybe not. So, you know, there's a there's a, a uh, what's the word, zeitgeist? Um, if you strike one, sometimes some of these incomprehensible massive bestsellers, I mean only in terms of why they were, it's a function of the very moment that they they struck, you know, a large think about the hula hoop. I never worked that one out. <laughs> and on that note, um, I would like to say we're giving away a book tonight to thank all of you who bought a copy of Crime Scene and have a numbered ticket in it. Jesse or John, if you will hand me that. I could hardly believe it that I got a book called The Education of a Coroner. <laughs> I love it. And actually, he is the coroner of Marin County, California, right across the bay. And he has worked high-profile deaths and serial killers to inmate murders and Golden Gate Bridge suicides. Now, he doesn't confirm this, but one of the most interesting things that I ever learned in one crime author hosting thing, and I don't know if it's true, but according to this author who had done some research, not one person has ever jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge facing the ocean. Everyone they have been able to find and determine has jumped facing San Francisco, which I think is an absolutely fascinating <laughs> factual well, you to live here tonight. That's fascinating, is that there's always suicide prevention debates. Will people kill themselves anyway? And sometimes they will. But when it comes to bridges like the Golden yeah. Gate Bridge, if you stop people from jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge, they don't generally try a second. They're time. actually putting a net down now. Yeah. Did well, you duh. read that? <laughs> that I mean, How long is it very take? low. But they're, well, anyway. Um, so, um, Jonathan, would you pick a number between 1 and 26? And that lucky person will. Between 1 and 26? 14. Okay. Is that, are you a 14 over there? Splendid, then you get this book. 
All right, um, please give our authors a round of applause.